riverfront development plans. I can't speak for this organization, but uh, I don't know if that's true or not. There are many issues facing the voters for us to participate in a debate run by not entirely friendly forces on a single issue when our opposition seems to be avoiding the normal channels of exchange just not going to happen. Our record is an open book. Where do our opponents stand on all the issues? Where are they? Who are they? I'll stop there. Uh, next week at the League of Women De uh, Voters debate, I'll discuss whatever issues anyone in the community would like. Glad that I've been doing it for several years on television and newspapers and anywhere else that I had the opportunity to speak what I was thinking about at the moment. I don't think Mr. Camperary has uh, missed any of that since he calls me from time to time to complain about the fact that we're doing it. Um, in terms of uh, focusing on a single issue, I uh, think Mr. Klein has made a, a good case for the fact that it's a very important um, thing to the village that's proposed the development. It's probably the most valuable single asset that the village owns. Um, it probably is the one development project that is going to make the largest single impact on the future of the village. And it is the uh, primary uh, source of, uh, I would say, really has uh, the most potential for uh, helping us uh, shape a future for ourselves that uh, differs from the you know, malaise that we've suffered over the last 20 years. Um, Mr. Camareri uh, refers to the funny season, which is what he calls the election time. I don't know why, but he does that continuously. And uh, points out that he intends no disrespect to all those who signed a petition that stated uh, that they did not oppose the idea of mixed use development and they are not in the make it all apart camp. I haven't seen any petition. I would like to uh, have had the opportunity to ask Mr. Camareri without a gavel on his hand what exactly his definition of mixed use is. I would have liked to have asked him particularly his uh, projections that they have about this uh, benefiting our tax base, how that works. Um, I would have liked to hear him explain how the loss of a, a primary uh, asset like the waterfront that we have spent money on for less than we've spent on it, uh, which would foreclose our ability to ever recover what we've spent on it, let alone the benefit from it, works out to be a benefit to the village. Um, there are so many questions that I would like to ask him about this, and I've been asking him many of them for uh, better than a year and a half now. He's still not here to answer them, so draw your own conclusions. I'll answer any questions that you have to Thanks, Don. Jeff? Good evening. My name is Jeff Fiella. I'm a 35-year-old life member of Vosney. Uh, I believe tonight is a very important night to come here and talk about the waterfront. It's uh, a shame that the Democrats didn't show. That shows you, the public, that they don't care about these issues. As you see at the village board meetings, when you go there ask questions, they're ducking them. This is your taxpayers' dollars working. You need to make a choice and protect the waterfront. I mean, we have a lot of environmental issues that we need to look into. And as far as development, it should be the taxpayers' choice of what they want to put down there. Housing shouldn't be put on the waterfront. We need to protect our assets all the time. As far as bringing more businesses and stuff down into the waterfront, that's what they should have a panel of, of the community and also of the local government to plan a better site construction down there. But the housing is not the way. And your taxpayers aren't going to make anything from the Capelli deal. And that's basically what I have. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much, Jeff. Okay, well, uh, I'm going to start with uh, just a couple of questions, and as I said, we'll open it up to, for all of you. First question is for, for Don DeBar. Uh, Don, there have been a lot of different numbers thrown about as far as what the financial impact of this project will be to Austin, both the cost and benefit, depending upon um, who you listen to. Could you please uh, help us understand uh, how you view the financial impact of this project? <sighs> okay. We'll start with the numbers that the village government has used uh, since the July 13th meeting where they aired the proposal. Uh, Michael Zarin, special counsel to the village, said that the uh, straight freight, the uh, non-abatement tax uh, that would be paid on a project like this uh, would be approximately $12 million over a 10 year period. That averages out to $1.2 million doesn't necessarily mean that's what it would be over the course of the year. I've tried to make further inquiry if I haven't, but it's worked with $1.2 million a year. The reason that people pay tax 
taxes, uh, real estate taxes to the village and the town and the county and the school district is because these different municipal entities provide services, provide services essentially. The prop, uh, proposal uh, in front of us is a proposal that uh, would lock, essentially lock in a payment in lieu of taxes. Well, first, it would make the property the project tax exempt. This would be uh, this would happen with the vice call the industrial development agency. In this particular case, the Westchester County Industrial Development Agency. Titles of the property would be conveyed what lawyers call nominally. In other words, the, the deed would be in the name of the Westchester County Industrial Agency. There would be a lease to Capelli at the end of uh, the ten-year period. Title would revert to Capelli. Long story short, property is tax free, and instead of the uh, tax, there'd be a payment of about five and a half million dollars over the 10 year period, leaving a net deficit between what should be collected on the property and what is proposed to be collected of about six and a half to seven million dollars. Since the services to the people that are going to be living in this are the same as they would be if compelling held title would be uh, the full free. Obviously, there's a subsidy of uh, the services to be provided to those people by whom that would be by the taxpayers of the village, taxpayers of the town, taxpayers of the school district. You're going to hear from people, you won't hear from Mr. Camberary because uh, he doesn't go into that much detail, but you'll hear from some other people that um, this is an oversimplification of the facts. And uh, although I heard from Ms. Markowitz that, it, what, that it's not the facts, you have to concede that it was when the attorney corrected it. And that, in fact, you can't uh, look at people's uh, you know, the tax that should be paid on a piece of property as indicating the services will be consumed by that particular piece of property. And my response to that is, we should all let me examine our tax bills and go back to the village and say, okay, can we have a 40, 50% tax abatement and leave Capelli out of the loop for a while. Thanks, Jeff. As Don said, the figures show uh, as far as the taxes, you tax people are going to be taking the burden from this project. If this goes forward, Capelli is going to have at least four years before he can just start developing the property, and none of you will see anything as far as a park or anything else. As far as your taxes, though, you'll be taking the burden. And not only will this project put a strain on the parking, the water systems and also the electrical system that would have to be put down there to support this. Okay, thanks. Um, next question. This one's for, for Jeff Viola. Uh, the village board seems to be comfortable with the way that the public has been involved in the process to date. Do you agree that the public has had enough input? And if elected, what would you do to change the process? Well, I believe the public has voiced their opinion as as far as against the Capelli deal. Uh, their voices are going to deaf ears. Basically, the uh, incumbents are listening to you, but they're not really hearing your cries. They're even decided before they get to the meeting what they're going to vote on and how they're going to vote on it. Uh, things are being done behind your backs. And uh, if I'm elected, I will have a government where the people work hand in hand with the local government to, to make things happen. Because if you people are the taxpayers and you don't want something done, then we shouldn't do it. Thank you. Don? Sure. Uh, village board seems to be happy with the way that the public's been involved so far. Do you agree that the public's had enough input? And if you were elected, what, if anything, would you do to change the process? process doesn't need change and stuff like that. Uh, I'll give a brief history of how the process has been employed here, which should uh, answer the question. Starting with the uh, July, uh, June 24th, 1999 uh, scoping session, there have been a number of meetings subsequent, July 13, 2000, and August 15, 2000, particularly, where many members of the community came to speak with the village board and express their uh, disapproval of the project altogether or at the very least asked them to stop and not sign off on it, as was the case on uh, August 15th of this past year. People have expressed all kinds of concerns about the fundamental design, the concept of uh, dense housing uh, development on the west side of the tracks, 
problem with uh, building tall buildings and uh, obscuring views, uh, the possibility of gentrification effects of uh, building high income housing you know, in the um, lowest income district in the village. And um, over the course of the uh, time from June 24th to date, the only changes in the proposal have, if you ask the mayor, have been made based on the weather rather than the rather extensive input that the board has heard right now. People can talk and provide input, um, and that is not the entire formula. And the village board does not listen, does not base its uh, actions upon what uh, the input it receives from the public, then really it's an exercise of futility. I would listen and I would act on what I heard from you. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question is for Jeff again. Current proposal would eliminate Harbor Square Park and replace it with a six-story apartment building. Uh, how do you feel about this? And we have a, sorry I didn't bring this out earlier, we have a map of the plans, the color. Uh, both you guys feel free to, to use that if you want in terms of answering the question or, or any other questions. Okay. Well, first of all, like I said before, I am against any housing along the waterfront. Uh, I believe that uh, since they do have that nice dock there for the ferry, there should be a little harbor square down there so that way they can have music concerts and, and do things for the recreation for the village uh, taxpayers. Uh, and also that when the people come in to, to visit or to shop from the ferry, they have somewhere to go through. And, and like down in, in the Main Street Plaza there, you have your Saturday farmer's market and that. You can have that down at the riverfront too. Uh, I think that we need to look at the riverfront and really sit down and decide what the taxpayers want to do down there. Uh, a lot of environmental issues still open. Uh, I know when the Maui site closed, they didn't do a cleanup, and I know there's other stuff down there. Uh, they really need to look at this and, and plan it with the community. Thanks, Tom. Um, sorry. Okay, let's repeat the question again. Uh, the current proposal basically put a six-story apartment building on where Harbor Square Park is right now. Could you just comment about that? Uh, yeah, uh, number of things. Um, number one, uh, I have very definite uh, feelings about what should happen there and very definite ideas about what should happen there. And even if I'm elected mayor, guess what? I don't own the property. The property belongs to the village residents. So uh, what I would like to see happen down there is essentially irrelevant. However, I do have some considerable experience in uh, real estate issues over the last almost 30 years. I have seen many developments from Montauk to Albany go uh, up and down over the last 30 years. There's a lot of information I could bring to the process. Uh, there are a lot of experts that I could draw upon. Just basic fundamental information that's not going to cost a million dollars in fees to communicate to the public. It can be done cheaply. Um, by using GoTV and little flyers, not you know, five color glossy flyers that are designed to uh, get people to accept what's proposed rather than ask what they want. That's what I would do. As to what should go down there, let's ask the people of Austin. Okay, thanks. Uh, this will be my last question before we open it up to the audience. And it's for, for Don. So. You don't have to ask me to repeat it. <laughs> you can, Jeff, if you want to. Uh, the current proposal calls for, I believe, uh, 225 apartment units and 16,000 square feet of commercial space on what's called Parcel A. We have the map there if you want to use that. What are some of the environmental parking and other issues involved here? Okay. This is uh, first one of the uh, distractions that the village uh, government has used to explain this project is to call it mixed use. When you look at this property, this is where the Killbrook uh, crosses Westerly Road. This is where it goes out to where the buses used to be parked. Uh, this comes along the water here. This is where the Austin Boat Club is. This is about where the Maui property is more or less here. But you can see that instead all this pink, it's mostly buildings. This is an apartment and commercial project. This is not mixed use. Mixed use is uh, 
it was proposed, for example, at uh, Brooklyn Bridge Park, where you have 16, 17 acres of land, and perhaps two, three acres of buildings, not when you have five acres of land and better than three acres of buildings. Um, I think, in terms of environmental issues, the first environmental issues that have to be addressed are what damage has been done there already, and what is the cost of remediation going to be. I've been asking for the study that was conducted by Capelli. It's required under the contract with the village, and it was due in September of 1999, to see uh, the answer to those questions. I asked the mayor this past Tuesday. He still doesn't have the answer. I asked him, why haven't you defaulted Capelli yet before you entered into a contract that obligates us to spend the money to do the work when it's more than a year overdue, and he didn't have the answer. So in terms of what needs to be done down there environmentally, uh, we don't have the fundamental information yet. Clearly, though, there's some serious negative environmental impacts that are going to come from clustering all this housing on our only five acres at the Hudson River. Thank you. Yeah. As I said before, I'm against the housing going down on the riverfront. Uh, yes, there are a lot of environmental issues at hand. Uh, parking is going to be a problem because what they're proposing is one car per unit. Where are all these other cars going to park? Out on the street. Right now, down at the riverfront, we have problems now parking. Uh, and also the sewer and water lines that are going to create havoc down there. And also the electric. Uh, the environmental impact study, as Don said, we have not seen any. And I'm sure that there has to be some core samples retaken to ensure that the, the ground is safe even before they put in the first pipe. Thank you. Great. Okay. Well, enough of me. Uh, I think that microphone over there is working. So as far as audience Q&A, what I would just suggest is that people can line up there and ask their questions. Please state your name, give a question, um, and who the question is addressed to. Tom Langston, 33 Terrace Avenue. Uh, this uh, question is uh, addressed to Don DeBar. As I understand it, the uh, Capelli will be paying two, uh, about a quarter million dollars for the property. How should the town or how would professionals determine what is the market price for a piece of property like the property we're talking about? Okay, actually, I'm glad you asked me that because today I was at an Austin Bar Association luncheon and uh, there, um, an attorney who's an expert in certiorari and uh, in eminent domain uh, law went through the three types of appraisals that he used in each case. Um, obviously, the answer is that property appraised. Um, there are three types of appraisal. One is uh, based on income. Another is based on comparable value. And the last is based on cost. Um, now we're talking about vacant land. It's difficult to do a cost, and unless you look at remediation costs in order to turn it into vacant land, uh, I, there's no income um, of any value at the moment. And so you would look at perhaps potential income based on property like that. Um, or in terms of comparables, you would look for comparable properties. Now, uh, some things are are easy to compare, and others not. View from that site, for example, is quite unique, as is its status as a uh, locale next to an, an express stop on the Metro North train. Also, its relationship to the larger community, the fact that the community is, although physically perhaps almost overdeveloped, economically it is underdeveloped in many ways. There uh, is uh, a lot that can be done here that would increase the incomes of the people here and the general economic activity. Uh, looking at this piece of property within the larger context, it might be hard to come up with a value, but I think it would be impossible to value it into a quarter million dollars, uh, unless your calculator broke on its way up. <laughs> I don't know how they can decide that they're going to build on this property when, when Mrs. Maui donated this land to the village and deemed it as park. Uh, how do you put a, a piece of value on a piece of property that you want to use as far as scenery and a place to go down and enjoy with your family 
And it, it shouldn't be right that anyone comes in and tries to develop this land unless the community wants to develop it. And the Democrats shouldn't be doing this. They should be listening to the taxpayers. Thank you. Great. Um, other questions? Hi, I'm Mike DiPaolo. I live at 63 Orchard Road. <coughs> Uh, both the mayor and the developer have indicated that the uh, density of the project uh, is needed to uh, create what they call critical mass. And I assume from the developer's point of view that means suitable profit. But from the mayor's point of view it seems to be about uh, uh, priming the pump and, and creating beneficial business, driving business up the Main Street. So I wanted to know what your feelings were about this concept of critical mass and whether you think this development uh, will have that effect on Main Street. Uh, either one of you, please. As far as critical mass, uh, I think they're just trying to put as many housing developments in there so the Capelli deal would make uh, enough money for profit. And I don't think all these houses are going to be pumping money up into Main Street. You said most of the people are probably going to get on the train and go work down the city. It's just going to be a drain on the resources. Stated, I agree with what Jeff said, but in terms of dealing with the question. Um, the concept of critical mass is a valid economic concept, obviously. Uh, there are certain things that uh, we reach thresholds of activity where there are spillover effects, and um, I don't know if the mayor understands this, but uh, people that are involved in development uh, do see uh, a need to have a certain amount of either density or activity or you know, just a quantity, you know, like an excess of quantity, whatever the thing is you're trying to have happen. So that it's self-sustaining and perhaps even ignites activity in the surrounding areas. That said, uh, it seems to me that since the critical mass that they said they had achieved, um, just barely achieved with the last proposal, which was for 330 units and a hotel and an 800 unit uh, parking structure, and the variety of uh, tax incentives and things that were being granted at that time, and the monopoly control over commuter parking that was being granted at that time. Um, if that was barely the level of critical mass, and now this new proposal that sheds all of it, except slightly increases the density on the waterfront land, achieves critical mass, then to me, it seems that the critical mass that we're talking about is maxing the developer's property and have a value, uh, profit rather, and has absolutely nothing to do with the economic spillover effects here. They haven't been demonstrated, they haven't even been articulated. And when I hear that, then we can discuss it. Right now he's throwing around a term of art that I don't think he understands. Next question. Uh, my name is John Cotton, I live on Ferris Place. Um, at uh, the public hearing, I guess the one that took place uh, in August, um, one gentleman got up and talked about the whole issue of, I guess he called it corporate welfare. Um, how Capelli's uh, development would have uh, an extremely negative impact on people living in the area close to where the development would take place. Um, there would be pressure on individuals who are living there, renting there, and the owners there. Um, I'm wondering if either of you would just speak to that. Um, just to make sure I understand the question you're talking about, just in general, the kinds of effects that, uh, that this project would have on the people that are here? Well, uh, I mean, my analysis of it is that if you put um, a building like that and you uh, put that kind of structure in there, charge those types of rents, um, in, in effect, you're gentrifying um, the waterfront. And um, the waterfront, is, as you already stated, is not a well-developed area. And this would negatively impact many of the people that live down there now. Um, I can say from speaking with people uh, that I know that live on, uh, say, Hill Street and Market Street, which you know is maybe the next layer up off the uh, plane of the waterfront area, um, and uh, that their view will be obscured almost immediately. That's a negative effect. I can s definitely say, and I know the mayor and, uh, and his friends have been working around trying to do damage control at this point, but I haven't pushed it, um, but it's something that definitely needs to be addressed. If you stand at the waterfront and look up the hill and imagine you know, this uh, construction down there, 
and you're pulling in you know, very high rents that are at way out of scale with what else is going on in Austin, and you look up, look up the hill, to your left you're going to see Stoughton House, but to your, to your right you're going to see Maple House, and they are uh, maybe uh, 20 years apart in age. Um, they're uh, much more similar uh, in uh, architecturally and uh, in terms of the uh, types of service that can be provided to tenants than the balance of the housing stock between those three points. If one were making a conscious plan for gentrification, this would be an ideal way to just triangulate it. But even absent that, certainly the effect is going to be there. Coincidentally, the timing is such that the uh, subsidized uh, financing of those two projects is coming up in the near term. And with upward pressure on the market rents in general, and then also with the compelling need, I said compelling, not compelling, need uh, to increase uh, taxes elsewhere to help pay for the subsidy of this, uh, the, the move for the owner of those properties is going to be to refinance, shed the uh, requirement to provide subsidy, subsidized housing, and to go to market rents. And it'll be worth refinancing those buildings and doing whatever renovation work is required because the, the, the uh, variation between, uh, you know, the, the vector between the rents that are being collected now and being able to collect with market rents in the new market that will exist, uh, is going to make it worthwhile. So. I think this project will cause a drain on, this, on the, uh, as far as the market value and, and, and also the surrounding houses, they probably will try to increase their rental uh, profit so so that they can meet what's coming in. So yes, it will cause a, a strain on the development and also the, the community as far as rental increase. Thank you. Next question. Uh, Marine Lane, 35 Main Street. I was wondering if there's any way possible, being as the waterfront property at, at present belongs to the village, why um, the Meredith Hitchcock building and the old trolley building can't be used as um, land, land, negotiated as landmark buildings and be used to bring, uh, you know, revenue in there and. Um, they're both over 100 years old, and they're both very, very sound buildings. And the Meredith Hitchcock building would be perfect for the uh, prison museum, which apparently there's already a $5 million grant for that. And um, down there, you know, it could be reached so easily. And, um, Residents shouldn't be on the waterfront because they're strictly going to be very, very filthy rich people and they're not going to walk all, all the way up the hill to the stores on Main Street. And what was that? As far as the question goes about the possibility of using, say, the very rich for example, uh, and uh, having uh, looked at the hand. Uh, Landmark designation as such. Yes, it's possible to do that. Um, there has to be a decision made by the village government to do so. Um, I haven't analyzed it or seen any workups architecturally in terms of the uh, structural integrity of the building. However, looking at it, it's hard to imagine that it's in worse condition than the bowling alley was structurally. So I, I imagine that something could be done with it, and it is a, a historic building. There are a number of other historic buildings down there, which actually uh, Ms. Lane has. Uh, pointed out to me uh, on a couple of occasions that uh, if we're looking at uh, developing a tourism uh, industry in the Hudson Valley, and uh, Austin certainly has much to offer historically, then these things, these few items that are in key places should not be wasted willy-nilly. That's essentially what's happening. And uh, so, yeah, I think there's some merit in looking into it. And, uh, you know, as I said, I don't know the, uh, I haven't seen an engineering report or anything, but looking at it, it's a nice solid brick building and it's, it's, it's very attractive and it comes from a part of our history that uh, we should be you know, trying to preserve and offer the rest of the world. I am 
for tourism, especially in the, in the village of Austin. We do have a lot of landmarks, like Miss Lane pointed out. Uh, but that is up to what the taxpayers want to do as far as uh, developing and making a park and having also uh, some tourist attractions down there would be fine. That would bring people to make some money for Austin. Thank you. Next question. Uh, hi, my name is Sharon Rowe. I'm at 32 Stone Avenue. Um, I'm not familiar with the processes here in Austin. I moved to them one year ago. But I am familiar with what they're doing in Hastings on the waterfront with the Regional Planning Board, Rob Lane leading that, and what's happening with Scenic Hudson and reclaiming the waterfront. So I would like to know what has been done or what can be done to bring in these groups to mediate and generate ideas among the community about what can be done with the waterfront. Either one. And whether the mayor has or his team brought anybody in on this from that point. Uh, I'll go back. I'll start and work backwards. Uh, August 15th of this year, uh, the village board voted to, uh, to, to revise development agreement to enable essentially this project to move forward and adopted a final scope of work, which is sort of the enabling document in the environmental review process. At that meeting, among uh, about 30 other people that spoke, three, four hours, and there were more people that wanted to speak, and some people that we could tolerate. Uh, was uh, Jeff Anzavone, I believe, from uh, Cena Hudson, and uh, he asked the village board to defer the vote that evening. There's, by the way, no contractual obligation for them to do anything that night. Um, and uh, so that Cena Hudson could sit down with the village and uh, review a uh, number of issues that are of interest to them. Uh, for people that aren't familiar with Cena Hudson, it is not. Um, you know, a green space forever organization. They're looking to scale. They're perfectly comfortable with dense housing. They think this is too dense. But, you know, half that was would be satisfactory to that. Something in between, I think, too. I can't speak with them, but I've had some discussions with them. And this is not uh, open space as the two we're talking about. However, the board voted that night five to nothing without deliberating after hearing from this person and 30 other people. I know from the uh, discussions that I've had over a period of time with other similar organizations that people have tried to have input into this process and the village has not been interested in hearing anything they have to say that, that, that deals with making changes to the proposal. They are very glad to have them on board to say, yeah, we like it. In terms of uh, these groups though sitting down and saying, you know what, can we adjust this? No, they're not interested. And so, you know, I don't... I don't know that there's much possibility of uh, pursuing it uh, along those lines, although I'd love to see it happen. As I said before, you have been going to the village board meetings, you have been complaining, you have major concerns. We went through this with the, uh, the cell tower on, on top of the high school here. The board will listen to your cries. But they're not. They're, they're going to go for whatever they decide. They already made their choices. But this is where you have your choices to vote for someone else to come in and work with the community, which I am willing to do. Thank you. Next question. Good evening. I'm Maureen Redmond, and I live on Sherwood Avenue. Uh, we need to beef up our tax base. We need to take the burden off of the taxpayers. We need to bring business into this community. Could you do a short synopsis of the park, partial park, and compare it to what this project um, is at the moment, and suggest which one would do more for our community financially? Who would you like to answer the question? Um, okay, first, uh, if uh, you are living, you're in your house and uh, your income, say, is a little insufficient, and you need to, so your spouse or your kids, your parents tell you, you need to make a little more money, the solution is not to turn around and pay the rent of the person next door which is more or less an analogy for what this proposal is right now. If we need to increase our tax base, 
we don't increase our tax base by one factor and our costs by a larger factor. That's what's proposed right now, that we subsidize Capelli for $700,000 a year for the next 10 years. Um, in terms of uh, the variety of ways that this property could be used to add revenues to the village, um, there's some things that pop into mind. I nosing around when I found out that they were looking at uh, collecting a half million dollars a year in taxes for this huge project. Uh, I, and they were talking about building a world-class restaurant. I looked at the tax bills at the uh, restaurant in Dubs Ferry. It escapes me the name. Sure. Charges. Pays $360,000 a year in real estate taxes, just that one restaurant. Now, if we had that down there, we'd have almost the same money that we're collecting on this entire project, but we wouldn't have 400 more residents to, to you know, provide services for. By the way, we'd have a lot of space down there. And we'd have the possibility of doing other things with the rest of the property that would not bring in additional income or not. Uh, that's one possibility. Uh, in terms of parks, there are a variety of ways to fund what Camarari, Mayor Camarari called the other night a big meta. There's federal money available, there's state money available, and there's private money available. It is possible to set up a nonprofit totally outside the control of the village and fund the, the acquisition and development of this. Pay the village back whatever they paid for, it, the real costs, and then operate it as a part of the charging mission, whether you uh, lease out kiosks to businesses and take a ride on the money that they collect. There's, a, there's a, a variety of ways all that is required is the will to do it. And apparently that will doesn't exist. But certainly a subsidy is not the way to start out. I think if you're going to develop this, uh, I would say maybe make it into a park, but also that has, like Don said, a restaurant or even have charter boats coming in so you can take tours up to the Hudson River, go all the way up to the Bear Mountain Bridge and back. So that way the parks can be used and also small businesses can come in. You still can have your former markets down there. But I don't think that the, uh, that riverfront property is not gonna bring you a lot of subsidy to your taxes. We need to bring in businesses in Austin because we have a lot of vacant buildings still open in Austin. You have stuff on Croton Avenue all the way down. I mean, we need to uh, entice businesses to come in so they can invest into our community. Thank you. Great, anyone else? Other people? Hello, my name is Joan Royal. I live on Beach Road in Austin. Um, I realize that the focus tonight is on the waterfront, but being mayor is a large responsibility, and being mayor and or and or trustee doesn't mean that you are one issue candidate. There were questions asked uh, tonight, especially the one just asked by Ms. Redmond, and I'm wondering how you feel the waterfront project. Um, will be the springboard, or whether it will be the springboard, for development that is so critically needed in the rest of the community. The other part, there's two parts to the question. There have been extensive studies by um, previous boards, the Chadbourne study, um, where professionals that assessed uh, the zoning in the waterfront area. We have a zoning ordinance that's in place, and it would seem to me for reviewing both, that the uh, Capelli project in no way conforms to um, either one of those documents. I would like your comments on that and how you feel um, the board that is in place now um, has handled that situation and what you would do if you were sitting there since the project is in no way um, in keeping with anything that is proposed in our own zone ordinance. Thank you. Well, if I was mayor at this position, uh, I would have walked away from the Capelli deal already because he has not provided environmental impact studies and our zoning is not up to par for that project. And to change the zoning would take a lot to do, which I'm sure they're trying to do uh, behind closed doors as we speak now. Uh, but as far as we need to bring in more businesses into Austin, like you said, it's not just the waterfront, it's all over. There's, there's other major issues in this village. 
and it's uh, it's going to take the community working hand in hand with their local government to get this stuff done. <sighs> okay, we have in uh, May of '95 the Chat Board study. Uh, we have in '92 or '93 a gross revision of the uh, WD1, basically the establishment of WD1 and WD2 uh, zoning districts, which are waterfront. Uh, Development districts, waterfront, is for the waterfront districts at that, that, that area, special zoning, three of the close to. Um, this is the result of uh, work that I've seen documented back to 1967 that culminates in essentially a set of conditions where, right now under our zoning, a maximum of 90 units would be approved on this parcel. When a developer comes in and proposes something two or three times uh, that on your own land, no less when the village owns the land, uh, you have to anticipate when the village signs on the dotted line that either they A, intend to revise the uh, zoning ordinance, or B, to that they have a reasonable expectation that a variance is going to be granted by the Zone Court of Appeals. I don't know which it is that they anticipate. I do know that I've heard the mayor uh, say repeatedly that um, the, the Capelli organization has uh, spent, uh, depending on which time, uh, better than a million dollars in studies and in moving this application forward. I'm assuming that they have reason to believe also that there's going to be uh, a successful outcome to either amending the zoning ordinance or uh, providing a variance. Some of the things I'd like to ask would be, um, what has happened since May of 1995, uh, when the Chat Board study was published, or 1992 or 93, when the zoning ordinance was revised, uh, or uh, previous incarnations of our law going back to 1967, where what was first contemplated was open space and then uh, restaurants. We were talking about only three or four years ago, uh, letting John Eccles and some other people build a uh, brew pub on the site of this, rather than uh, a five-story apartment complex. Um, I don't know the answer to uh, the question, how did we get here, uh, but I do uh, understand the question and I share the question, and I just wish that the mayor were here to answer it. subsidy. Uh, we're also going to be looking at 
um, you know, exposure in a number of other areas as far as the infrastructure goes. Further, I suspect that the subsidy amount is based upon many faulty assumptions. They'll say right now, the school district, I believe, in fact, is starting to float this, that uh, a project with 153 two-bedroom apartments is going to have no more than 10, 12 children. Uh, I don't know that that's true or not. And certainly, I don't know that that's going to hold to be true for the next 10 years, certainly. And quite frankly, I don't think that the school district or anyone else without a crystal ball is competent to really tell us in a way that we can, you know, like you would want in a contract, um, that this is so. That they underestimated last year the incoming kindergarten class by a factor of 100%. So, um, in terms of other costs, you can stop and think about, uh, um, you know, uh, the added traffic of, you know, another two to 400 cars pounding the streets and going up and down. The cost of making the real thing that, that is uh, where I feel we're exposed is the area of doing prep work. It's not prep work. The need to widen uh, Snowden Avenue and uh, to basically set the site up for the development that's coming. People tend to look at, you know, uh, the, like ripple effects of development as always being beneficial. Well, gee, we would never have done this to Snowden Avenue. The people that live in these areas, though, when suddenly the traffic load is perhaps doubled or more, suffer a diminution in the quality of life and the value of their property. Um, in uh, a million things like, I can't let my kid you know, cross the street anymore and such. I don't believe, and I've been trying to uh, you know, pry in discussions, um, answers out of the mayor, the board, anyone that I can speak with there, that any of these things have been explored. And we're told they're going to be explored in the environmental review process. We've been watching them manage the environmental review process for a year and a half. I'm not confident with how that's going to turn out. Chip. I don't know what the cost would be increased, uh, but I do know when the project starts, you're going to have uh, large dump trucks and excavating equipment going through your narrow streets, and it's going to cause havoc. I would like to see a, a park where you could go down and, and utilize different recreational things like maybe kayaking, uh, boat rides, and, and possibly a restaurant down there where you can go walk along the edge of the river. So I go down to the, uh, the uh, riverfront now, I sit down there once in a while and, and watch the sun go down. It's, it's a beautiful asset, something that we have to protect. But for us to move forward, we have to move forward as a community. And your taxpayer dollars should be running this government. So you should have a say in what goes down there. It's not just one person, it's we the people working together. Thank you. That answer the question. Um, the uh, personal vision that I have of this uh, property or the use of this property uh, essentially is that this is a gateway to our community. Over the next period, we're starting to see it now, um, little fits and starts, we're seeing it up and down the river. Uh, people are looking to the Hudson River as a means of transportation and you know, it's an entryway already for people coming from Rockland County. There's some problems with the existing arrangement, but it's a fact and that's going to probably increase. Also, People, I hope, over the uh, next period are going to be using uh, mass transportation more than they do now. And Austin, again, as an express stop on the uh, Hudson Line, the Hudson River, um, is, you know, that, that's going to be what people see when they come to Austin and they get off the train. If there really is a tourism industry, for example, that develops here, people start commuting using the rails, uh, you know, going from community to community rather than just into that happen the way it's done now, which is uh, one of the uh, development models that people talk about now. Um, 
This is going to be what people see of Austin first. So what is it that we want to present? And that requires going to the heart of the question or the heart of the issue. What is it that we are? And what is it that, uh, that we want to become? I don't know necessarily that what we are now, certainly I don't think that's what we are now, that what we want to become is a community of high-rise uh, apartments um, owned by you know, a landlord, um, gentrified, uh, wasting the most valuable land that we have. If this is a model for the development of the balance of the community, I'm leaving. Thank you. I have uh, three questions. The first question is about the ecology. Uh, how, do the, how do both of you feel about the intrinsic value of nature by itself? Uh, how do you feel about the way that Lou Capelli handled the situation in Dobbs Ferry regarding the development called the landing? Uh, in which he trampled upon Native American sites that had uh, valuable historic, historical uh, ancient relics. And in Dobbs Ferry, according to numerous residents, there are toxic substances upon which the landing is built or nearby that are very deleterious. They're going to be very deleterious in the future. And uh, to the, in, in their opinion, and they did a lot of work on this with outside help, the uh, Luke Capelli paid a minimal uh, bit of attention to that possibility for the future of Dobbs Ferry residents. And on you know, the same ecology question, when Luke Capelli has continued to violate the rules and regulations set up by the uh, village of Dobbs Ferry, uh, they really don't have anywhere to go because they, the a previous government had approved the the development. So how do you two feel about uh, dealing with Luca Pelli now when something can be done? The second question is, do you believe that this is part of a master gentrification plan that will uh, eradicate, for the most part, blacks, Latinos, poorer whites, and Asians? And then the third question is, uh, to both of you, and, and I'd like to just parenthetically say that following this, and I followed it from the onset, it seems that Mr. Debar, uh, Debar Dinas, has spent an inordinate amount of time studying this, which bodes well for the village of Austin if he's elected mayor, but I'd like to ask both of you how much time you spent, and give some examples regarding this issue. Well, I'll work backwards with your question as far as how much time I have spent. I have not spent as much time as Mr. Debar. Uh, I know of the issues by reading upon them and also attending some of the meetings at the village board. How many village board meetings do you attend? I have made this year six. I was away a lot. But as far as the environment, the environment is our life. If we don't protect our environment, and, and protect what, what we live off of water, land. We have to. That's why I said the environmental studies are very important, and I think that new core samples should be taken up all over that land, so that way that there is no dumps that we can build on. And as far as, uh, what was the other question? The second, uh, the, the, the second question was, do you believe that this is part of a surreptitious gentrification plan that, 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 that would, would the end goal of eradicating blacks, Latinos, poor whites, and Asians. Well, I don't know if it's a plan, but it, but this project, if it goes through, there will be high income people living in the area and, and there won't be any low income people living in that area. And do you think it will have an impact upon the adjacent communities like up on Grand Spring Street? Uh, I think it will take effect and have an impact from the train station up to Spring Street. I don't think it will go as far of Spring Street. So you don't think that the fact that the some of the landlords are already jacking up the rents, you don't think that that's going to continue? Well, that, that will continue, but that happens in all developments. Well, at Snyder, wouldn't you say it would happen a lot more in Austin if this plan is allowed and, and all these uh, uh, affluent people come up that have no roots in, in Austin? Okay, um, let's 
see. Uh, I'll answer them in order. First, have to do with ecology and complex questions. So I think my struggle with a little pointer back to the question. Uh, my uh, estimate of the intrinsic value of nature, um, without going into my uh, personal religious beliefs or uh, my personal overall philosophical, philosophical view of the planet. Uh, clearly, we are part of nature, and uh, as some hold, actually, we spring from nature, um, kind of cutting off your legs, uh, destroying the ecology. Uh, and anyone that's taken an earth science course in high school realizes that we need oxygen, and we need water, and we need uh, clean soil, and uh, anyone that's ever been outside on a spring day knows that it's kind of nice when there's green stuff out there instead of big buildings. Um, there are, well, there's a legacy of uh, industrialism along the Hudson River. It's the uh, last epoch that uh, we sort of have slid out of the last 20, 30 years. And uh, that industrialization, you know, the original industrialization took place in an environment where people did not fully understand, as they do now, uh, the complexities of and the interrelatedness of, of producing products dumping the excess compounds into the uh, air, water, and soil, and consequently up and down the Hudson River, as everyone knows, there's contamination um, of all kinds, metals, copper, uh, for example, in uh, Hastings, um, where Anaconda produced wire, also in Austin, where Hudson Wire produced wire, in uh, North Tarrytown, where Mallory Battery dumped uh, mercury into the soil, and, um, million other uh, different businesses up and down, industries up and down the river. Okay, so we have some choices to make. One, do we continue to do that? Uh, two, do we uh, just leave things as they are? Uh, or, uh, I guess this is really one, two, three, but one is to uh, remediate it, another is to leave it as it is, and another is to continue in that fashion. Um, our quality of life in the next period is going to be determined by the choice that we make. That's first. Secondly, given all of this, we know that there's contamination at these sites without seeing a remediation study, without seeing the testing. If you look at the water in the Kilbrook, you can see the copper. Um, if you look at the rocks at low tide, you can see the interaction of different materials and the salt water with the rocks and the uh, plant life and everything else. Um, if this project is enabled, for example, and uh, done in the fashion that's being done. We're never going to know what's there and what got cleaned up. And more importantly, neither will the people that are going to live there and also the many thousands of residents that the mayor plans to pack into this here little park. We won't know what's under that either. Now, they do know now in Dobbs Ferry um, what is in the ground. And when people started to discuss it in public, Capelli's organization and his attorneys decided that sharing that information with the public was more than the legal and political process it should tolerate. And so they went to court and got an injunction to silence the free speech rights of the people that wanted to say, hey, by the way, see this place? It's got this compound in it, that compound in it, that compound in it, that compound in it. It was one of the, it was the most aggressive egregious uh, legal action that I've ever seen taken in connection with a real estate development project bar none, and I come from 30 years of experience in that. In fact, you can ask him, Ellie, because I sued him about a month ago. <laughs> um, so I don't know uh, how that bears on what's going to happen here, uh, but I certainly don't think it bodes well. In terms of whether or not there is a master gentrification plan, uh, in effect with uh, both the uh, classist and racist and uh, every other type of uh, thing that would follow from it. The plan isn't as necessary to discover or its existence isn't that. It's nice to know because it gives you some insight into the characters involved and will help you predict the behavior later. But what you do is you figure out what's likely to come out of what you're doing. And it seems pretty reasonable to expect that the already taking place gentrification and speculation around this project is going to be completely exacerbated when it's actually built. I spoke before that if you look at this site architecturally, structurally, and in terms of physical plan in general, and look up the hill to Snowden House and up the hill to Maple House, um, you look at some of the other moves that have been taken by the village government, 
the location of the new police station, the implementation of a number of policies where the money's being spent to improve infrastructure. It is very clear that they are building what they call a critical mass around some very definite items. And I believe gentrification is a very strong part of that. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're just a little bit over an hour. We started late, so that's why we're running past uh, past 8.30. Um, I think we probably have time for just one more question. Probably for someone who hasn't asked one before, and then we'll go to the closing statements. Sure. So, uh, take the mic. My name is Kevin Brennan of Hamilton Avenue, near the, well, near Spring Street. I don't understand very well the nature of this Capelli project of building. I think it's mostly residential stuff, maybe a few businesses. I think one small park, it may block the view for quite a few people in the area. I don't know if the present incumbents and others have made any kind of explanatory statement to the community and taxpayers of Washington what the supposed benefits of the project are so that they might win the hearts and minds of the taxpayers for it. I, so <coughs> I'd like to know if there is any such statement, although I suspect perhaps there is not. And I'd like to know if the whole thing can be put through without any taxpayer approval. Just, you know, the local politicians decide to go along with Capelli's idea and sign the necessary papers and go ahead with it without most of the community of Boston and understanding what's going on. But if there are possible benefits to the project for the community, I would appreciate that that could be explained so that maybe it's not really such a terrible idea. Or, also I'd appreciate if some modified version of it could be made. Maybe the high-rise building's not so high so they don't block the view so much. I was following them the buildings or, or housing units I'm in. And concerning a business development idea, what someone else mentioned about various vacant buildings along Main Street, Crowthen Avenue, and the like, if Capelli would like to join in to renovate those places so they can be usable and profitable, and so forth. That's what I think about so far. Any comments from all of you? Just uh, to answer the, uh, the question, uh, the, some of the fundamental facts. The proposal uh, would permit construction of 225 residential units and 16,000 square feet of uh, commercial space on the site, um, of which uh, approximately 8,000. Some chunk of the commercial space is going to be dedicated to what's called a uh, world-class restaurant. Um, there's uh, two primary structures. One is going to be very close to the south end near the Austin Boat Club where the fence is. It divides the Maui uh, property uh, from uh, the Boat Club. The other will be, uh, we've seen various configurations of it, uh, several towers on the uh, land where the bus property was. Underneath uh, the larger structure will be the accessory parking, I assume, for the uh, buildings. Um, there is at the moment uh, an estimate that one parking space per unit will be allocated. So um, there are a variety of uh, issues there with zoning and uh, other requirements that have to be dealt with. In terms of uh, hearing uh, the proponents of the project um, act like proponents other than just voting to, to uh, do it and gather with people when they don't ask questions out of turn or something. <laughs> Their opportunity to present the uh, upside of this project was tonight, and I will see them here. I think that speaks volumes. As Don said, there is no upside to this project. It's just going to be uh, absorbed by the taxpayers. And if, if you people want this to happen, just vote the Democrats back in. Okay. Um, that's it for the questions. Sorry we're out of time, but I know that uh, 
Jeff and Don will be around uh, after the debate's done for a little bit and be accessible for the questions. Uh, just left, uh, there was one last thing I didn't answer. Well, how about we've got a closing statement there. Okay, okay. so um, I think uh, you started off with the opening statement, so how about Jeff? Uh, go ahead with the closing statement. Two minutes. I would just like to say that uh, I am looking forward to serve you if you elect me as mayor. Uh, I want to work with the community and work out a lot of issues, not just with the waterfront. There's many other issues in this community uh, that you are concerned about. And this is your chance as taxpayers to, to make the choice and, and the difference. So you have to come out on November 7th and vote. And I hope that you come out and vote for me. Thank you. Just to uh, finish that, and I guess that'll be my closing statement. Um, the uh, Village Board uh, definitely uh, can approve the project if they're allowed to uh, without uh, any input that they have to listen to from the public. Uh, they have to hold hearings and they have to allow us to speak on occasion. Uh, they don't have to act on any of it. So who's making the decisions is a very important part of what's going to end up uh, coming out. Um, I have been working on this for a long time and a number of other issues. Um, I intend to work on this whether I'm elected mayor or not. Uh, it'll be impossible for me to be much more effective, obviously, if I'm elected mayor. However, in the event that I'm not, I will do everything possible to prevent this from coming to pass until the people of this village have an opportunity and I can promise to tell you a blizzard of litigation to achieve that. That's what it takes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Don. Thank you, Jeff. And thank everyone for, for, com for coming to uh, debate. We're not, we're not done yet. We're going to take a break.